Our scripture this morning is from 2 Corinthians 12, 6 to 10, and then James 2, verses 1 through 4. From 2 Corinthians, even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delighted in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for where I am weak, then I am strong. And then James chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Perhaps nowhere, well, let me back up. Perhaps in most churches, they do not face or struggle with the issues that we do. They have different issues in their life, but we, we struggle with our health and with other things. And um, we're always looking for an answer. We're always looking for a reason. We're always wanting to know why, at least I am. Speak for myself, McGee. And I've learned that the Apostle Paul, he learned to know the depths and the all-sufficiency of God's grace through the trials that he went through, through the school of pain and suffering. And the passage that was read to you this morning, the context has both, I think, strange and wonderful words in it because they come from the heart of this aging apostle. He, they're strange words because they, they don't deal with the subject of pain and struggle and suffering in the way that we would like for it to, but they're wonderful words, I think, because Paul shares with us the assurance that God gave him a deep, heartfelt, a soul-satisfying assurance that God was going to be with him and deal for him and with him. And in light of his struggles, it's interesting to note that the Apostle Paul was no stranger to the power of God. In his lifetime, he had, he had seen the miraculous. In his lifetime, he had seen people healed. Through his ministry, he had... Uh, reached out and delivered some from the power of Satan when they were, they were demon-possessed. He, he cast out evil spirits, and he also saw the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of many, most of whom had been pagans all their life. And at the message of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, they came to know Jesus as their Savior, and their lives were changed all through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Why then? When you read all of the things that the Apostle experienced and all that he accomplished, why then was he denied healing and deliverance when he sought it so earnestly? Why? How could a man of such spiritual depth, a man who had such, was, was, was so close, if we, if we are to believe his relationship with the Lord and the intimacy that he had with the Lord, why was he denied deliverance? Three times, Paul said, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said no, three times. Three times he sought deliverance. Three times he asked God to minister to him in a way that he needed, and he said each time the Lord said no. 
And the question you can honestly and fairly ask is why? Why would God, why would the Lord not respond to this aged, gracious, powerful man who had served him so faithfully? Why would he not respond? And I think Paul would tell you if he were here this morning that I learned some things. I, ha I learned some lessons. And I, and I think I'm able to suggest that he learned some things because as you read through his writings, the nine books of the New Testament that he wrote, you hear a lot. He talks to you a lot about himself and some of the things that he experienced. And I think the first thing he would say to you this morning is, though I was not healed and I was not delivered from all of the struggles that I, in, uh, that I went through, that intimacy and fellowship with God was far more to be desired. That intimacy and fellowship with the Lord was more valuable than being delivered from whatever specifically he was asking for because we don't know what his thorn in the flesh was. Some suggest that he had poor eyesight. Others have said he had some, some variation or some means of malaria. We, we really don't know. But he said, I beg God to help me. In the New, Living New Testament in chapter 12, verse 8, I beg God to make me well again. Each time he said no. But that's not all he said. That's not all he said. Each time I begged him to make me well, and each time he said, no, but I am with you, that's all you need. I'm with you, that's all you need. The NIV says that the Lord said that he said, my grace is sufficient for my power is made perfect in weakness. Reverend A.B. Simpson, who was the founder of the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church, wonderful people, great movement of God. He got a glimpse of this truth and he once wrote, and I quote to you, once, listen, once I sought healing, now I seek the healer. His presence with me is greater than all of my human needs. God himself is greater than all of my spiritual desires. To know him deeply, fully, is to live life at its satisfying best. Did you catch the first part of that statement? Once I sought for he healing, I wanted to be touched. I, wa I wanted physical satisfaction. But then he came to realize that what he really needed was a deep relationship, an intimate relationship with God. And my dear friends, at our age, if I may be so bold, at our station in life, at our point in life, what we really need to learn is that intimacy with God is far more desirable and far more beneficial to us than health or wealth or prestige or anything else that we could acquire in this world. Paul said, I asked three times, heal me, deliver me, set me free work in my life. And each time he said no, but that's not all he said. He said, but I am with you. I'll be with you always. I think if Paul were here, were here this morning, he'd say, I learned a second lesson. The second lesson is that God reveals his strength through human weakness. And all through the scriptures, we see that. The scriptures tells us over and over again that God demonstrated his power by using weak vessels, weak people. Why? Why would God delight in using weak things? Because the more, uh, when, when something is accomplished, when something is achieved through a weak vessel, the more obvious is, it is that it's not the vessel's doing, but it is God's doing. And he receives the honor and he receives the glory. The scripture tells us specifically in the New Testament that the Lord, it pleased him to confound the, the wise with the foolish. And it, it pleased him to confound the weak with the strong. But why the weak? Why the weak? Couldn't we accomplish more through our strengths? Couldn't we accomplish more by using, couldn't God get more done by using our talents and our skills and our, all that, we, that resides in us? Why would he rather use the weak things? And the answer to that, I think, is found in the fact that our strength 
focuses the attention of others on us rather than on God. We get the credit rather than God being honored for it. Years ago, I read and, and I found it here recently. I found this, the story of Beethoven, the great composer. At 32 years of age, he was deaf. He became totally stone deaf. And he wrote what is called his testament. And I want to quote some from, from that testament. He wrote, and I quote, It was impossible for me to say to men, Speak louder, shout, for I am deaf. How could I possibly admit an infirmity in the one sense which should have been more perfect in me than in others, a sense which I once possessed in the highest perfection? What humiliation when one stood next to me and heard a flute in the distance and I heard nothing. Such incidents brought me to the verge of despair, but little more, and I would have put an end to my life. But it was after Beethoven lost his hearing and after he wrote this testament that he composed what is called two of his most brilliant pieces of music. The second symphony and the ninth symphony, which is, we are told by those who understand music better than I do that it, that it has no comp. It was in the silence of his own mind that he was able to compose. And this world is musically richer because of his weakness. God used his weakness to bless the world even today. Paul learned that God could use his weakness more than his strength. And he wrote, and I quote, that is why. For Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I think the third lesson that Paul would say to us if he were here this morning, that I've learned through my weakness, through the difficulties that I've experienced, he would say that God's grace is sufficient to meet every need in life. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you'll find Paul lists all of the struggles that he went through, the difficulties, the abuses that he suffered. He said, I was frequently in prison, shipwrecked three times, I spent a day and a night apparently floating in the, in the Mediterranean, stoned three times, beaten with rods three times, whipped with 39 stripes five times. That's 195 stripes. His back must have been one massive scar. He said, I was exposed to robbers, to cold, to hunger, to thirst, sleepless nights. And you have to ask, how was it that Paul was able to survive that? How was he able to take it? And he would say to you that it was the grace of God, the sufficient grace of God that gave him the power to take it. And the knowledge that God is sufficient to meet us when we are struggling, when we are suffering, when we have things going on in our life. That knowledge doesn't come overnight. It's sort of like a big oak tree. For an oak tree to, to grow, it takes years, and it takes years of sunshine and rain and wind and storm to drive the, the roots deep into the earth. That's sort of how it is with us to learn that God's grace and to learn to lean upon it and rely upon it even in the midst of all of the troubles that we face. And his victories and his struggles and his suffering paid off big time. He had committed to the Lord in the midst of all that he suffered. Churches were were established all throughout Asia Minor. And to this day, we are blessed with his words that are contained in the New Testament. Now, here's the hard part of this message. It's hard for me to say it, and it'll be harder for you to hear it. But I believe with all of my heart that our struggles and that our sufferings here in this life are designed to drive us into the word of God and into the arms of our Savior. You say, what about all those out there that are suffering? What is their pain? That, a lot of it is bad decisions and poor decisions in their life and, and all things going on. But for us, when we struggle, I really think God wants us to turn to him and rely on him and trust in him. Some time ago, I asked one of my dear friends here who's really been going through some difficult times and still is. I said, may I ask you a question, a very personal question? He said, yeah. I said, are you closer to the Lord today 
than you were before you began all of these. And before I got the question out completely out of my mouth, he said, oh, yes. Oh, yes. So much closer. I really believe that we go through a lot of things in our life, a lot of struggles in our life, to break the chains that this world holds us by so that we will be ready for better things down the road. My mother suffered from lung cancer for two years, took radiation, her chest was like leather, it was so burnt. And all through the years when you talk about dying or getting ready to go, mom would always say, well, I'm ready, but I'm not anxious. That was her pat answer. And if you ask mom, well, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, I'm ready to go, but I'm just not anxious. I want to see my children grow up. And then later it was, I want to see my grandchildren grow up. And I, you know. But after two years of radiation and her lungs getting worse and her inability to breathe got worse. In fact, we had a fan attached to the end of her bed blowing air in her face so she could breathe. Mom was not only anxious, she was ready. She was ready, but she knew the grace of God in the midst of it all. So I guess the painful part of this message this morning is that when we suffer and we're struggling and, and, we, and, and we don't know why, we might consider the fact that the Lord is preparing us He's preparing us to reach closer and get closer to him. Get closer to him. Last couple of months, I've had things happen to me that I never expected and, and don't like. But I want you to know, I'm a little closer to the Lord. Today than I was in September. And as you struggle, I hope you will be too. Now, this is not a sermon. You're going to go out of here and say, boy, that was a great message and everything's exciting. But, but, I, but, I, but I really feel the Lord wants us at, at our stage and at our age to understand why some of the things that come upon us are there. To drive us into his arms. To turn us to his word. Because he deeply, deeply wants that relationship with us. For so many, the relationship is shallow. For so many, the relationship has been off and on. But what we really need is that deep, personal, intimate relationship with God in preparation for seeing him someday. Help us, Lord. Help us to understand what it is as Christians you want us to do and how we're to do it, I pray in the name of Christ. Would you stand with me this morning? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. We're so thrilled that you're here. Hope that you'll come again. If you're visiting family, enjoy them. Enjoy the sunshine and, and all that goes with it. How you doing? Across the street, there's some coffee, there's some tea, some punch, some cookies. Join us, won't you? In the meantime.